Recording has Thank you. No, thanks. Sorry. Okay, so this one. Okay, yes, please. Okay, it is now my great pleasure to introduce um, Associate Professor Kay Lowe. Uh, she's Adjunct Associate Professor at the University of Canberra and Director of Read for Success. Since completing a PhD at Indiana University, she has been a senior academic at the University of Kentucky, James Madison University, the University of Western Sydney and Charles Darwin University. In her current consultancy role, she works in more than 40 Australian schools, um, K to 12. Kay was director at the Kentucky Adult Educators Literacy Institute and has worked in many literacy and learning contexts, including P to 12, parent education, adult education, jails and workplaces. She's written six books and numerous articles on literacy learning. Her latest book, For the Love of Reading, Supporting Struggling Readers, she has been the recipient of many national and international literacy grants. So please welcome to the microphone. Have, have a drink of water while you stand up. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'll, 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 I'll put you a fresh one. There's, There's a fresh one. one. Yeah. I know you've been sitting there for a long time. <laughs> Have a break. position to ensure that every child has a hot book in his or her hands. The fact that you have parents coming in and for some adult readers, the fact that you are the person that they can communicate with to help their child can be their motivation for literacy success. I was director of the National Kentucky Adult Education Literacy Institute. Kentucky is the second most illiterate state. More than 47% of the adult population in Kentucky are functionally illiterate. A lot of money gets poured into trying to overcome that problem. But that's not what I want to talk to you about. I really want to share with you some insights into how reading works. I've worked, done this work in the ACT with Canberra librarians and I just know that if you're the person standing at the desk or in communication with an adult, if you could just give them some of these strategies, it could be the thing that helps. I'll get you to read this out aloud. Off you go. Okay, you're librarian, so you should have done a better job than that. You got to the end. What is it that you know about reading? Yeah. Ultimately, you know it must make sense. Most struggling readers, children through adults, think that it's about the squiggles on the page and they're usually stuck back there on oh, well, no, you're trying to get it to say only. 26 letters in the alphabet between 74 and 144 different ways of sounding them. Least effective thing to do. This is Amy. She's in year seven. It doesn't matter. She could be 36, 65 or in year two. It's the pattern in the miscues that really matter for us to understand how reading works. If you take a look, the text said silk, she read skill. The text said presented, she read prediction. Aware, a war. What do you notice about a miscues? Pretty close in terms of phonics. She's often just rearranged the letters. 
take a look at the shape and size of those words. Often the same shape and size. In the world of reading, there are three queuing systems, graphics and phonics, and semantics and syntax. So in terms of graphics, that's to do with shape and size, and phonics, pretty close in terms of the letters. She didn't say football oval instead of predict, um, presented. She said prediction. But in terms of her weakness, what do you think that, that would be? For strengths in graphics and phonics, what's the weakness? Semantics, meaning. Because you can't put a skill in the place of silk. You can't say a war instead of a wear. The sadness for me is Amy sitting in someone's classroom putting as much time and effort into reading as anyone else. She's just putting it into ineffective strategies. She doesn't know how reading works. How did she get to year seven not knowing that? Just amazes me really. So if someone comes into the library and I'll share some strategies with you, even for you to be able to say, read on, go back, have another look. That could be the thing that helps this reader because Amy, she thinks it's about graphics and phonics. She doesn't know what you know and that is it must make sense. I spend a lot of time talking to readers, particularly struggling readers. Pretty much the same pattern whether they're 8 or 88. This is Kevin. Kevin. What do you think about yourself as a reader? Not good. Then he suddenly feels that shame and humiliation that we heard before. I also need to know that adults can trust me because if they don't trust me, they shouldn't be working with me. Kevin quickly changed that to all right because he'd rather not talk about it right now. Kevin, why do you want to improve reading and writing? I want to improve reading and writing so I'll be smarter in life gets me a bit further. The sadness in that is the adults that I work with equate their failure in the world of reading as meaning failure in life. They put those two things together. Kevin's in year nine. He's already doing that. But it didn't start year nine. It probably started way back there in year one. When I work with adults, they can usually go back to an experience around year, year one or two where they recall <coughs> the day that they perceived themselves as having failed in the world of reading. They'll recall what the teacher was wearing, the book they may have been holding and who was sitting next to them. And when you're meeting with a 26-year-old or a 65-year-old and they're still crying about that experience, you know the emotional baggage that's attached. So when they walk into a literacy centre and ask for help, that's a big step up for these people. Kevin, what do you do when you come to words you don't know? I guess I don't even read it. How did he get to year nine not knowing how to read and what strategies to draw on? Again, leaves me wondering. Kevin, tell me about a book you've read. I haven't read a book, but why would you? I don't go into motor mechanic shops or read motor mechanic magazines. It's no different. Kevin, what do you think about reading? I don't like it because it's hard. Take a look in your own life. What have you taken up recently that you defined as hard? You probably do what you can to avoid that thing. It's no different for the adult reader. Kevin. What do you do when you're in class and you have to read? Well, I read a bit and then I get my friend to read. There are a lot of codependencies built around reading failure. Often adult readers know who to hang out with, who's got their back. So they never have to put themselves in the position of taking the risk. You can't learn to read if you don't engage. And those very coping strategies that Kevin's been developing since kindergarten year one have been holding him in good stead. To step outside of that and take a risk, it's huge. Kevin, why would you want to do this? I want to write to my dad. He moved to Melbourne three months ago. Particularly with adults, well, I say this for kindergarten children as well. It's all about choice. Adults have to make a choice that's relevant to who they are and where they are in their lives. So if an adult reader appears in um, the library that you're working in, it's probably the right time for that person to take the risk. There's no place to start with Kevin except for, that, for there writing a letter to his dad. He just needs a keyboard and to get started. My intention for everyone that has an opportunity to listen to a, an adult or a child read is that that adult or child walks away knowing what it feels like and sounds like to be a successful reader. Kevin hasn't had too many experiences of that. I said, Kevin, choose something to read. I need to hear you read aloud. Reading aloud is a performance. 
So I'm also wary of that, that Kevin may not perform reading very well, even though he could be a reader in his head. I said, Kevin, choose something. He had a look. He said, there's nothing here I can read. I said, take another look. He said, no, nothing. I quickly scribed on a piece of paper. This is what he told me walking into the literacy centre. I handed it back. I left some clues in there. They're Rebus clues. If you notice the numeral eight, West Belcon, and I suspect he knows it from his sweatshirt. I handed that to Kevin and he read it confidently and fluently. He hasn't had those experiences very often in his life. And so I'm going to have to do a very quick version today. This usually takes me two hours, but I'll try and give you some strategies. So if you're in that situation of having someone want to read something to you or they trust you enough to take the risk, then you need some strategies that work to help. The other thing, adult readers who struggle can't really spell all that well because the connection between reading and writing and spelling, they're all interconnected. The only difference between a good speller and a poor speller is that a good speller can look at a word and go, that doesn't look right. But if Kevin's not reading, he's definitely not writing. He doesn't have too many images in his head to know whether those words are correct or not. They all just go hand in hand. I'm just going to quickly, that's Kevin and Amy, and I'll keep coming back to them a little as we go through, but I just want to quickly, as quick as I can, unpack how reading works. If you could just read that very quickly to yourself. The most natural way for us to read is silently. Okay, you probably read it. What's it about? Football. <laughs> Football. Some of you may have thought it was football because of the names of the teams, but you probably moved your thinking to think it was about cricket. In order to read this, what do you need? You need to know about the game of cricket. What else do you need? The language of cricket. And the third thing would be interest. See, <laughs> some of you got, you got to the end of the first sentence and went, what is this about? Is it time she finished? I'm out of here. No different for our readers. When someone's interested, they have background knowledge and they have the language under control associated with what it is they want to read, they're more likely to be successful. Wonderful when someone walks into the library and says, I'm a struggling reader, but I really love football, etc. There's your key because often they have that language as well. But what we need to understand is that at the core of reading is comprehension. Reading, in fact, is comprehension. You know yourself when you have to put things together from flat pack instructions, you might not be able to do that. Not because you couldn't read it, you just couldn't comprehend it. Reading only occurs when comprehension takes place. So keeping that in mind, sometimes we have adult learners or children in school who have a lot of knowledge of cricket, interest in cricket, speak like a commentary, commentator but really have difficulty reading. I'm very quickly going to show you what's going on inside your head when you're processing those squiggles on the page. This is one sentence. If you could normally I get you to do it three, three times. If you could do it twice that would be great. Read it to yourself. Okay, if you could write down what that just said. Okay, we're doing the quick version. Is there someone that will share what they have written down so far? I'm going to stop you after almost every word, so don't worry. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> it was around. Stop. It was. Do you have it was? 
Anyone have it must have been? Great. And what did you say next? <laughs> around midnight. Everyone have around midnight? No, you didn't. Who had about midnight? Soon to be midnight. Close to midnight. Almost midnight. Midnight. Just plain ordinary midnight will do. Okay, thank you. Keep going. When I returned home? As I approached the bungalow? Okay, great. Keep on going. I turned the headlight off. Turned off. Did you all have the words turned off? Switched off. Turned off. Lowered. Anyone have dimmed? Anyone have dipped? Okay, great. Good group. Keep going. Thanks. And what were they that you switched off? Headlamps. Headlamps. Everyone have headlamps? Some people didn't even see headlamps. Headlights. Car lights. Just boring lights. Great. And what happened next? Uh -huh. Swung in the driveway. Some people forgot the swinging into the driveway. <laughs> what did you do then? Shine them. Shine the lights into the side bedroom window. Just window. Side of the bungalow. Great. And? Everyone have Harry Pope. Yes. Anyone have Harry Potter? <laughs> really, sometimes Harry Potter turns up, Harold Potter turns up, and I do this work in a lot of schools, like I said, and in two cases, Pope Harry turned up, they were both Catholic schools, but that's pretty amazing. Okay, just very quickly, why is it that some people have switched off, some have turned off, some have dipped, some have dimmed? Why did some people call them headlights, car lights, headlamps? Yeah, see, this is what... Our adult readers don't get. It's just what good readers do. As a good reader, every time you read, you're changing switched off to turned off. You're putting in headlamps instead of headlights. You're calling them lights. And why do you do that? Yeah, it's just how you use language. So in your household, you call them headlights. In yours, you call them car lights. And you just you refer to them as lights. You switch off lights, you turn them off, you dip them and you dim them. It's to do with how you use language. But our adult readers often think that's a problem. They haven't got it right. There's something wrong with them. And they drop back to thinking that to her, it should say the. And why doesn't it? How come the rest of the world gets that and they don't? Because no one showed them how reading works. Truly, you can teach an adult to read in a weekend. One, they have to have a desire and a purpose for doing that. Often it's associated with their children. So when they come into your library, they're vulnerable. But if they've got their children, you know that this is the time that they really want to make this work. Or if they've applied for a job or if they've found a job and this is worthwhile holding on to. We've got kind of the advantage and there's leverage there because they have a real purpose for doing it. But they just need someone like you or me to say, this is how reading works. It's not getting to her yet to say that. Readers change the text to reflect the information they bring to the reading situation. It's just what a good reader does. Good readers strive for meaning. That's why you could read that phenomenal passage. And it wasn't about the first and last letter. I could change that around. You'd still be able to read it. Because where's the clue in this sentence? Calvary Road. Yeah. Road. There is no clue on that blank space. The adult reader and those struggling readers that I work with in schools think that's the clue. And they fixate. When they come to a word they don't know, they fixate. And like Kevin, they guess and give up. No one said, there's no clue there. And I work a lot with parents. I love working with parents because if we get children, I know that someone's from Shell Harbour or Wollongong. If we're working with kids in zero to five, what a difference we can make. And so if parents understand this too, they'll support their kids to be successful. Parents are often poking at words like there's a clue there. I say to parents, if you're a word-poking parent, sit on the other side of the room and put your feet up. Get a drink if you have to. There is no clue there because you as a good reader know that cowboy enrobes the clue. And you would probably predict pony, stallion, motorbike or cow. Those things work. The more knowledgeable you are about cowboys and what they ride, the more options you have. That's your semantic pool. 
So learners who come with English as a second language, they often don't have access to a semantic pool that big because they're just coping with learning language. But when a reader does that, get out of their way. Don't be correcting that. What they're telling you is they're comprehending. It needs to be celebrated, not made wrong. If they were doing what Amy and Kevin would do, if the book said horse, what would Amy and Kevin put in that place? It's pretty predictable. House. You know, as director of You Can Read, over 1,500 children came through that literacy centre. Predominantly, they would do exactly that. In terms of graphics, shape and size, in terms of phonics, house and horse are pretty close. But in terms of semantics, not too many cowboys jump on houses and ride away. But those readers don't stop to question that because they think it's about the squiggles on the page and not getting to the meaning that you know as a good reader. <laughs> we have time for that. But we have to be setting readers up for success. Reading is not a test. You know, every adult that I've worked with, they know what it's like to fail the test. They don't know what it's like to succeed. And so I'll very quickly share some strategies in a moment so that it's not a test and they don't perceive it that way. Like I said, parents are our best advocates for children's literacy success. I don't want us, you know, 10 years time to even be talking struggling adult readers. Let's get rid of that because we've worked with parents and put strong scaffolds in place. Good books make a difference and you are in a prime position to know that. I love librarians who talk books with passion and enthusiasm. And I know the key is getting that right book in someone's hand. Just recently, when I was director of You Can Read, we had a 10 year old boy in that center. The mum said, Kay, will you work with my 26 year old? I said, no, because I know there's a codependency in that family where mums run to a frazzle, she has four boys who can't read and a husband. But whatever she's covering for them, whatever she's taken responsibility, they never have to step up. So I said no, but if he turns up at my door, maybe I'll change my mind. He's 26. A week later, he turned up at my door. He said, I'm here to learn to read. I said, good, sit, let me show you how reading works. And I, in the olden days, I've been doing this for a long time, I'd go and find the book. If he said, I'm interested in cowboys, I'd go to the library, I'd buy them myself. But now I know that's not the choice. If he's really committed to this, he needs to get himself down to the library or take the risk. It's the only way he can get past those blockages. I said, you're going to have to find something to read. Don't come back if you don't. I can't work with you. The following week, he came back, Tuesday, 4.30, standing at my door. He said, I went to Belconnen Mall and there's a bookshop. I've never been in a bookshop. I found myself going into the bookshop. I took out my credit card and I paid $26 for this Bear Grylls book. He's a Bear Grylls fanatic. He's watched every DVD, interests, language, background knowledge, etc. It's all in place for him to be successful. He said, I'm up to chapter three. <laughs> I said, why well, in my head? I say, why did it take him to get to 26 for someone, not that I even put the book in his hand, for him to find the right book? It's the right book that will make the difference. Boys and girls' choices aren't necessarily the same. Boys, short, humorous. If the word bum's in there, it's often a bonus. <laughs> it's just how it is. Girls' choices look different to that. Same with adults, but take a look at dads in households. They're offering reading, short, factual, etc. Newspapers, sports magazines, I don't want to stereotype, but often that's the dad's choice in the household compared to what the mums might be reading. I'm after independent readers. I want you, the people that you come across who struggle with reading to get to be independent as quickly as possible. It has to be linked to a real purpose. It has to be authentic and meaningful in their lives. So they need to know some strategies. You need to know these strategies as well because you're in a great place to share them. But we have to promote everything we do with the love and joy. And you are doing that in libraries. So very quickly, because how long do I have? Seven minutes? Six minutes. <laughs> oh, six. I can do it. Okay, I have a website. All of this is on my website. When you have an opportunity to listen to a reader, whether they be five or 55, the best thing I can say when they're reading to you, they come to a word they don't know is to wait. 
parents often ask, how long do I wait? I say wait longer than you've ever waited before. <laughs> Zip your lips. It's not about you. See, in the olden days, we used to think we read this word, this word, this word, this word, then we went this, this, this. Well, we don't. Optometrists and ophthalmologists have shown us when we're reading, we're picking up information from all over the page. Another good reason not to be poking. So while you're in that waiting space, I tell parents also to breathe because sometimes they go into angst. <laughs> breathe, relax. <laughs> And while you're waiting, you're giving the reader opportunities to look around. You're also saying to the reader, I trust you'll figure it out. Get out of the way and wait. Avoid eye contact. Because often when the reader, whether they're 55 or 5, when they come to a word, they don't know, they look straight at you to be rescued. Rescuing doesn't help. Avoid eye contact. That means keep your eyes locked on the page. Because when the reader looks at you, the only thing they can do is look back to the page and more often than not, they'll get it correct. <laughs> and this is what you as a good reader know to do. It's just what struggling readers don't know to do because they're like Kevin and Amy. They have limited strategies, often to sound it out, it's their only strategy, the least effective thing to do. All you have to do is say, hmm, read on. I think you'll figure that out. What do you think it might say? Does it really matter if they say switched off instead of turned off? No, because reading's comprehension. That's what we're about. Does it make sense? You just said the cowboy jumped on his house and rode away. We're taking it back to be meaningful. Try that again. Go back to the beginning of the sentence. I wasn't quite sure what that said. Avoid unnecessary interruptions. I say this to parents, but I say it to you. I say it to anyone who's listening to someone read. We have to get rid of that judgmental language out of reading. Nothing's good, bad, great, because I know enough about struggling readers that if you're saying, if I was to say to this struggling reader, oh, great reading, he's probably sitting there going, yep, yesterday I heard her say excellent to my other friend that came in before me. Obviously, I'm not as good. See, the mindset of a struggling reader is to filter those kinds of comments when we don't really need to be making them at all. Avoid taking the reader away from the text. I have seen teachers, parents, some adult educators as well. When the person comes to a word they don't know, they give them a clue, sometimes like this, if we were to go back to that sentence about the horse. Driving up from Wollongong this morning, I've got um, probably around Heathcote. Remember, they were in the paddock. Uh, if I'm giving some kind of clue that takes the reader out of the text, it's in aim. Because tomorrow when that reader comes to a word they don't know, I'm not going to be sitting there giving them some inane clue, and there is no clue in Heathcote. The only clue the reader knows is right here in the text. And this is critical for me, particularly in the work I do with children in schools. Give praise for the reading, not the reader. See, Kevin and Amy need to know this is not about them. It's about reading. And I would want every child, I get passionate when I say it because it kind of, it makes a difference. I want every child to know they're whole, complete and loved just the way they are. And the conversation that I'm having is about reading in the same way I talk to you about cricket or swimming. It's reading. It's not who you are. Because when adults put those two things together, you know, that's not a sad, that's a sad place for them to kind of um, enter into the world of literacy and continue to take risks. So these are the strategies. When you have an opportunity to listen to someone read or you just want, these are great strategies for parents. These are on my web page where you can cut and paste and do whatever you like with them. But this takes away all stress and angst in households. It makes the parent feel like they have something to offer. If this parent only, um, not only, but if this parent is, has English as a second language, the fact that that parent cares to sit on the lounge and open one of your beautiful library books and talk maybe in their first language about the pictures, it's making a difference. So it doesn't matter your level of literacy, your language competency, it matters that you take time out. And I say to all parents, it's only 10 minutes. 10 minutes a night will make the difference. You don't have to think half an hour. It's 10 minutes. And if the child's struggling or the adult's struggling to read, just do echo reading. Echo reading is simply you say, mm, hang on, I love this story. Great choice. 
I'm really looking forward to hearing more about whatever's going on here. And with echo reading, I simply read the sentence in my normal reading voice and the adult or the child reads it back. So Kevin and Amy haven't had too many experiences of knowing what it feels like and sounds like to be a good reader. And all they're doing is echoing me, getting a sense of, oh, that's what I'm aspiring to. They never know that. How do they know where they're going? Shared reading is simply, oh, I'm really enjoying this book with you. Would you mind if we just take it in turns? Because I'm not going to be correcting all of those miscues. And if this text has some unusual words, vocabulary or people's names, etc., in shared reading, I'm not going to be picking that up. I'm just going to be reading the very next sentence. So the I read a sentence, I'm always the bridge. I read, I read a sentence. The reader reads the next sentence. I'll follow on by reading the next one. So I constantly keep filling the gap and bringing them back to comprehension. If every parent on the planet only knew echo reading and shared reading, we wouldn't have kids in schools with issues around reading. And the last one is paired reading. Just to give that um, adult or that child, you know, another level of confidence to say, hang on, I love this book too. Would you mind if we just read it together? Guess what? You'll miss you. <coughs> so will the reader. But you don't have to stop and talk about it. It's not a vocabulary lesson. We're just reading for the love and the joy of it. I probably have half a minute left, do you think? No, oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's 10 minutes, I say to parents. When I've worked with adults, I want to know their commitment. If they're not turning up at time, on time, I ask them to write every night 10 minutes. I don't care if they copy off the soup packets in their you know, cupboards or street signs in the neighbourhood. I just want them engaged. It's the very reason they're probably not literate right now and that they haven't been engaging in literate experiences. So it's 10 minutes and with adults, I would also ask, ask them to be doing some reading and writing around that. There's no one approach. We have to lighten up play. It's got to be worth turning up to. I understand the vulnerability of adult learners and I just want them to know that, you know, they're, they're safe and they'll be taken care of in, this circumstance, in these circumstances and that they're going to have to take risks in order to move. Place matters. Libraries take a lot of care in setting up their environments to, con to be conducive to readers. It matters. I say to parents, if it's not working at home at the kitchen bench, it's as simple as moving off that bench to the lounge room floor change the place and you change the dynamic of what's going on. If you have an opportunity to work with an adult and there's a little, you feel stressed, if you're feeling stressed and it feels more like that test situation, go outside, sit under a tree, take the book down to the coffee shop, go and do it somewhere else. At the core of all of this work that we do in literacy, there's a relationship. What a privilege it is to work with adults when they come in and say they need help. What a privilege it is to work with parents when they say they care enough about their children to take a risk. So I love that I'm working with you. Make it fun. If you're not having fun, why bother? I want kids to look forward to coming back to that next 10 minutes tomorrow night. I want those adults to walk into that centre knowing that this is worthwhile to turn up to. It's all about choice. Choice matters. I don't know what the choice will be for this adult reader, but I have sat through some pretty interesting choices over the years. I value the choice. I noticed, Stephen, you mentioned Paulo Freire. He's very much, he was very, his work was very much about choice. So I have to value this learner. I'm not doing this to the learner. I'm doing it with the learner. And I'm going to have to learn what that learner is interested in because it puts me in a position of not knowing, which is kind of a nice thing to have in shoring up that relationship. I do have a website where you can go and get those strategies. There's some information there. A lot of it was geared towards teachers and working with parents, but it's equally equivalent to working with adults. It doesn't matter 555. The only difference will be in the choice that those adults make and valuing the books or texts that they want to read. Thank you for working with me today. Do you have, have any questions? Oh, I that was incredibly engaging. Thank well, I wish you. I had <laughs> known that before. <laughs> I was Just teaching my daughter the read. <laughs> Desperately. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you've got some um, uh, yes, I would have done it. So you want to swap? So you've got other stuff you want to share? No, no. Oh no, it's just that I need to point to that. Oh, you've got a point. Oh, it's my point. Okay, well, that was that was very engaging. Thank you very much, Kay. I know you have to go, so thank you very much. I'm now introducing um, Pamela Osmond. Um, she's talking about the current challenges in um, for adult literacy, the role of reading, writing, hotline and libraries. Pamela Osmond has worked in the field of adult basic education since the 70s. She has taught in a range of contexts and occupied a number of management and curriculum support roles in TAFE. She is the author of a wide range of uh, teaching learning resources, including So You Want to Teach an Adult to Read and Literacy Face to Face. Pamela's present role is as a teacher educator at TAFE New South Wales and as a part-time consultant at the Reading Writing Hotline. She's at present researching the history of adult basic education in New South Wales. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jacinta. Um, I'm representing Vanessa Isles here today, who's the manager of the hotline. Uh, but who's on her way to Darwin to the ACAL conference. Um, I've also got quite a long history with the Reading Writing Hotline, so I'm always really happy to speak on their behalf. <laughs> and what I want to talk about today, see if that works. No, it doesn't. Um, is the, the gap, I don't know why it doesn't, it's not turned on, the gap in provision in adult literacy services in New South Wales. Now, I know that libraries have been working in this space for a long time. When I first went to Bankstown TAFE, uh, we had a really wonderfully productive relationship with the librarians at Bankstown Library. So I know that this is not anything new for you, but what I want to be saying is that at the moment, there's a big gap there and you're in a position to fill it. Uh, so uh, we'll look at some how might libraries help to address that gap and what can we at the Reading Writing Hotline do for you. Now, before I go on, I'm sure everybody understands the role of the Reading Writing Hotline, but just in case, <coughs> it's uh, a referral, basically a referral service. So people call uh, and want to uh, improve their reading and writing or call on behalf of someone who wants to improve their reading and writing, we can try to put you in touch with a program wherever you are and um, relative to your needs. Uh, we've got a database, it's a national service, we've got a database, we hope, of all the providers nationally, uh, and that's a challenge these days because it's very fluid. Uh, when the hotline began in 1994, it was, uh, there was a really extensive network of provision. So the whole field was a very different uh, beast from what it is today. In New South Wales, uh, it was mainly TAFE and to a lesser extent the uh, adult community education. There were both volunteer tutor programs and small group programs, six students to one teacher. Uh, so that when somebody rang the hotline in those days, we could nearly always put them in contact with a program close by. If they lived in Hay or Finlay or Mount Druitt, we'd look up the database and invert it with this tape, this tape teacher in all of those small country towns. Uh, so we could put them in contact and they, they get a, a program to suit them. These days, not so. 
particularly in New South Wales, I'm afraid. I just want to go back to that early era when adult literacy first became recognised as a, a named field of, of education, but not till the 1970s did the Western world discover adult literacy. Um, this was a period of uh, when, when talk of social equity was okay. Uh, when the Whitlam government came to power on a platform of, um, of improving social equity and social justice, and education was seen to be seen to be the way to bring that about. Uh, so our volunteer tutor programs and our small group programs came to be in that era. Um, before I go on, I want to introduce you to another another student, to Sue. Now Sue's story. Um, is one, and I didn't bring the book up with me, but it's one of a, from a, a little book produced by the Victorian Council for Adult Basic Education um, called A Fuller Sense of Self. And it's a little book full of stories of students reflecting on what literacy um, development has meant to them. And in part, this is what Sue said. When you find some success in learning, whoops, Go back. When you find some success in learning, you can be more open and involved in the community. Suddenly I took note of what was going on. I'd never voted before, up until five years ago, which was precisely the time I started coming to school. Learning gave me the confidence to want to vote and be interested in doing it. Sorry, not finished. Previously, I used to avoid coming up the street to do my shopping. I'd always had this feeling that people might be looking through me and into me. I know with me, <clears throat> I'm a different person now. I, I use Sue's story as a sort of iconic case story, a case study for, um, for talking about what's happened to adult literacy and adult basic education, because I think Sue's needs are not being met these days. Today, if Sue were to ring the reading writing hotline looking for a class, we might not be able to help her because apart from employment related programs, there's very little else in New South Wales. TAFE is still doing some little bits, but it's not consistent. Programs come and they disappear. Um, so unless you're looking for work, unless you are a job seeker referred by uh, referred to the C program, the Skills for Employment, Education Employment Program, there's very little else for you. Uh, now, I know that some of you who've, who've started adult literacy volunteer tutor programs have done so in response to that vacuum occurring in your own communities, that when TAFE's funding uh, has been cut, substantially and consistently over the last decade, two decades maybe, um, that managers have responded predictably by prioritising what was seen to be their core, core business of uh, engineering studies, building services, business services, and the programmes that we took on in those early years that had to do with equity and social justice have been sidelined. Um, it pains me deeply to say that because when when we began in adult literacy back in the late 70s, 80s and into the 90s, um, it was a really responsive program and adult literacy in Australia was, was seen to be a world leader and New South Wales was up there. So the fact that we've just vacated the field, uh, and, and this is not, this is not TAFE bashing because TAFE has had to reinvent itself in a new world to be uh, competitive and, and, and develop a corporate, a corporate being. Um, I think I'm going to have to move through this a bit more quickly. 
Um, the, the principles that were driving those early programs were these, and for those of you who are developing volunteer tutor programs, you will recognise them. Um, the programs that are still run in TAFE and the C programs for unemployed people can't address these anymore because now they're big classes and people churn through them very quickly, but you'll recognise them. It's being student-centred was the thing that was most important. Is that I'm going through some old literature, student-centred just pops out over and over again. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad I came behind Steve and Keiko and Geraldine in particular because they've all already expanded on this. They were individualised programs. Negotiated learning. What do you need to learn? What do you want to learn? We were able to negotiate what they wanted and, and their, um, the, the outcomes. How are you going? Have you got there yet? Do you need to work some more on that? So it was assessment in terms of the student's assessment. It was humanist, liberal education and literacy as a tool for personal growth. It wasn't just those cognitive skills of reading and writing that we were talking about. We recognised all those, in all of those stories, the personal growth. And emancipation was a word we used a lot then, coming from Paolo Freire. Uh, emancipation in terms of taking control of your life. I've talked about Sue's story. So the general theme um, for those 40 years, actually, that, that adult literacy has been going in, <coughs> in Australia, we began with educational for personal and social purposes, which may include work, but now it's become skills training for work. They're the only programs that are funded. Um, that's all that the, the, the sort of um, public discourse talks about with literacy. It's what it does for work and for productivity. So now to the reading, writing hotlines, statistics over the, <coughs> the two, 1994, we've been kept collecting statistics on all of our callers. Um, so by now we've got quite an interesting set of statistics, but nobody seems to be too interested in them. Um, so whether you can actually read that. So these are the people who call and say, I want, or most of them say, I want to improve my reading and writing and I don't know where to go. I don't know how to do that. And you'll notice that um, only a, a small portion, is it 20%, yeah, are job seekers. Now, as I've just said, on the database, that's nearly all we've got, the C program for job seekers. So if you ring up and you say, I'm looking for work, uh, okay, well, we put you in contact with your, your C program. If you're not, then there's very little else for you. And the, the not is um, either people who are not seeking work, which is, ah, here we go, not seeking work, which is a third. Some people are already in work. So they might just, you know, I can cope with work, but I've just had this baby and I'd like to be able to read to him when he gets a bit older, so I want to learn to read and write. Nothing for you either or people with part-time work, um, yep, part-time work, uh, nothing for them either. So what's out there doesn't really reflect what the needs of the callers are. Uh, I might have to let that one be, and we'll look at this one. Now, these are the calls by, <clears throat> by state in the last three month period. And what do you notice about that? New South Wales. Let's just compare it with uh, Victoria. 446 from Victoria, nearly two and a half times as many from New South Wales. And there's not that discrepancy in population. That's the population. So what's going on there? And just to check that that was a recent phenomenon, I pulled up uh, 
some earlier statistics, 95, 96, 96, 97, shortly after the hotline uh, started. And the difference was more in the ratio of, of the population. So, so what we think is going on there, why the... So what's actually happening is that people in Victoria seem to know where to go. If I want to learn to read and write, I know where to go. In New South Wales, they don't. In Victoria, there's a really, there's been a quite a vibrant network of um, neighbourhood houses and, and um, community houses. And from the beginning, adult they took responsibility for adult literacy, less so in, in TAFE in Victoria. Whereas in New South Wales, it went to do TAFE, which we were very proud of and we did it well. But TAFE has changed and left this vacuum. Um, the other thing is that in Victoria, I discover there, again, in the neighbourhood houses, they're using what, what, call, what they call um, pre-accredited curricula. So it's not mandated assessment. It's more like that earlier negotiated curriculum. Um, whereas TAFE is still required to use accredited curricula with mandated assessment, one size fits all, that doesn't really suit our, stu our students. So what can the hotline offer? I said there's, there's a big hole that, that, that we really like libraries to, to fill or to, to play a part in filling anyway. The hotline can offer <coughs> national networking information and advice. I don't know how your networks work, but uh, at the hotline, we, we're a, we have a national database. So whatever libraries are doing something and uh, you know, the, the volunteer tutor training that's offered in Queensland, Queensland in particular, Queensland libraries in particular, because they've got the same problem New South Wales has, that there's nothing much else going on. So the libraries have moved into the vacuum. So we can put you in touch with if your networks don't don't work as well as as well as um, ours do because that's what we have to do. Resource information. One of the things that we have moved into <clears throat> because we can't when, when somebody calls us uh, after a, after a course if there's nothing there, the teachers don't like to say I'm oh, sorry we can't help you. So they always when I listen to the teachers on the, on the on the phones now, they turn themselves inside out to do something. And often it's finding someone who can mentor you and will send you some information or will give you some links to uh, online topics, which is by far uh, the worst option. But still, if there's something that they can be working on, it's better than nothing. So we've developed a bank of resource information. One of the options that people go for is the, the um, is online and there's an awful lot of it as you would well know an awful lot of rubbish online so what we've done is go through some of those online links to look for what we think are the best of those um the the other thing is that we have <clears throat> links to the non-commercial resources the collections of student stories that are published by various um, literacy programs uh, and often those student stories, as, as we've been saying this morning, are the really, really important reading information for our students. Um, volunteer tutor referrals. If you're running a, a tutor, tutor training group, um, then people often ring the hotline and say, I'd like to, I'd like to tutor someone. Uh, there aren't, there haven't been too many volunteer tutor programs out there, so very often we just have to say they, they don't exist anymore. So if you're running a tutor training program and you want referrals, let the hotline know. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the SBS re-ran uh, a story on Insight. First time they ran it, they didn't put up the hotline's number. Uh, this time they did, and the next day at the hotline there were screeds of, of messages to return, and a lot of them, because it was on SBS, 
a lot of them were people wanting to be tutors. So now they've got this big long list of people who want to be tutors, uh, but there's nothing much out there. Is my time up and gone? <laughs> yes. um, anyway, so thank you for that and thank you for inviting us and we look forward to more really uh, productive working with the with libraries. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Great to hear the work of the um, Reading and Writing Hotline. And um, I'm sure there's a few libraries out there that could give you some information. Okay, so this next one. <clears throat> yes, the next one. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the microphone um, Kamal Sadar from Auburn Library Conversation. Auburn Library, and he's talking about his conversation classes. Uh, he's worked at Auburn Library since 1982 under many titles, currently Multicultural Services Librarian for Cumberland Council. In 2012, he established Conversation English Classes and in um, 2016 has written an evaluation report on that. Developing the community language collection is also a significant part of his work and very interested in the multicultural services to community and being instrumental in establishing popular uh, Arabic and Turkish book clubs. Kamal has been an active member of the Working Group on Multicultural Library Services and has been a member of the Working Group on Literacy as well and been involved in many campaigns. I'd like to welcome Kamal to the microphone now. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I would probably mention that I have presented this before, but for different reason. Council amalgamation is the main reason that uh, we have uh, come up with different version of this presentation. I hopefully it will be beneficial for some of you that haven't seen it before. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is the new uh, merged uh, Council of Cumberland, uh, which was uh, formed uh, uh, 2000. 50, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, in the middle of it, May. Uh, so it is uh, one of the largest in New South Wales. It is the uh, uh, fifth, I think, uh, largest council of New South Wales. And this has been part of the Parameter, uh, Auburn, and Horrock councils. So this is the combination of three councils uh, virtually in the geographic center of Sydney. And the population wise uh, is also uh, very significant and it is the fifth largest one. And there is another bit of information that I would like to share with you that uh, there are about 450 community based organizations in the area of the Cumberland Council. <coughs> so there are uh, a few other statistics on that. As you can see, other than the population, uh, there are uh, a bit of differences in the five top languages in the Cumberland at the moment and the um, number of uh, people born overseas have also a significant uh, compared to some of the other uh, areas of uh, Sydney and Australia in general speaking. Uh, Non-English speaking background population is around 50% in the new Cumberland uh, Council. And one aspect of it that uh, almost now 65.6% spoke of non-English speaking language at home. Um, so we call our program as conversation classes, but you might call it English classes or some other libraries may call it differently. Uh, so um, unfortunately, because of the government cuts budgets on the language learning provision, late 90s, some of the libraries have taken up this uh, the responsibility and uh, in my report I have found out that there are some libraries who have started uh, which has started this program before us uh, late 1990s so uh, that was mentioned 
Yes, uh, initially we have partnered with Mission Australia. Uh, unfortunately, this year after July, uh, they haven't got the government funding, so we are a bit short uh, left with the tutor training from them. So it is one of our challenges that we have to find new training partners in that sense as well. So initially we have started with three classes in 2002. Uh, so this is just one of the picture of the uh, classes that we have. So um, the way that we did obviously initially we uh, saw tutors from uh, the local papers. We advertised that uh, through the council channels as well. Um, that was uh, a difficult period for us. We didn't know where to start, how to start, and where do we go, uh, how many people would be turning up. Just there are a lot of uncertainties, obviously. Uh, so um, as part of that, uh, all included, uh, we have done almost 10 training sessions, uh, uh, tutor training sessions so far and um, we are trying to uh, find the new ways of uh, um, being in the training position again. Uh, the picture on this uh, uh, presentation is Don is uh, one of our uh, regular uh, tutor who is coming from all the way from Blue Mountains and he has two classes. Usually our classes is uh, only once a week by each tutor, but he was happy to run two classes. So, he, and also last couple of years, he volunteered to do the extra classes during the Christmas period, which we don't have classes mm -hmm. obviously. And as you would know, most other libraries probably do the same way uh, that the classes do run during the school period. So. <clears throat> Okay, with that, uh, we have also established resources for the tutors, which has been very helpful. Uh, we know, know that uh, most tutors, uh, although we have a very probably good collection of ESL and other resources, they go through those tutor resources that I have uh, set aside for them and make a copy of them and use them and borrow them if they can. Uh, yes. Uh, the way that we expand the uh, programs, uh, the main point is here that we kept it simple without any curriculum, without any particular programs to run and there is no registration or assessment because of our tutors that they are not professional teachers. It is not our requirement for them to assess the students and whatever. So our role is basically provide a very general level of English, but we also work with the tutors. The way that we have changed our programs in each uh, class, we ask them uh, what level would you like to teach, and we have uh, targeted those classes as beginners, intermediate, advanced level, or we used to run a few times IELTS classes and that sort of thing. So we put that feature on the brochures because we were getting a lot of requests before by the students, what is the level of the classes and who teaches what and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so based on that, also we have changed all available spaces of the council facilities and uh, uh, we have uh, done this sort of programs based on that uh, and also adopted to changes when it comes to again tutors request, request resources and class levels. And the current situation is that uh, we have under Cumberland Council we have eight libraries and many centers and so at the moment uh, most of these uh, programs run in, in most libraries including two community centers. And the participation numbers is just a rough number sometimes it is over that and sometimes it's around that figure. Uh, in one point we have picked about 43 classes a week, which is a record I suppose. Uh, I haven't heard anywhere else. And uh, uh, part of that success obviously is also um, having been able to manage uh, tutors meeting after each term and we have been doing this for a number of years. And that brings a lot of um, 
probably positive outcomes by us as well as by the tutors. And they more or less support each other when there is some situation in their classes, they might ask and bring the issues to the meeting saying that I have this situation, ask other tutors, how do you deal with it? So we do share a lot of information in that. Um, networking obviously and provide solution in different circumstances as well. Yes. I also based on that, I might mention that the Council Volunteer Program is an official one that uh, there is a coordinator working with that and uh, that position also helping us to find and recruit volunteers and go through that process and have induction program. And um, that is really a good starting point for us in order to expand our uh, program. Uh, what else do we do? Uh, so other than the regular tutor meeting, uh, we have changed our classes in order to be uh, tutors able to use the technology. Some do use laptop uh, facilities, some do use internet facilities. So, so we have changed uh, some of the resources uh, and the equipment in some of the places that we have classes. Uh, part of that uh, also, as uh, Jessica mentioned, that, that I have made up this report, which uh, again, to my surprise, that uh, not many places have got similar reports. And the information that I have uh, received at that time, that I have read, uh, or all the information that was available, um, Again, to my surprise, there wasn't much uh, written report on any basis of this kind of program. So maybe, as it was mentioned in previous uh, sessions, this might be another sort of occasion for applying some sort of, as, I don't know, grant program or some other uh, research sort of area as well. Uh, so this uh, report has been uh, widely circulated among multicultural, I don't know whether it's going to literacy group, I'm not too sure. Uh, and also part of our uh, aim is to increase this uh, different type of class situation, included reading, writing, and partly like a literacy. And in fact, we have targeted twice in that, uh, but it wasn't really successful. Maybe people weren't interested or initially they were. And also one of the tutors were also trying to come up with the uh, other volunteer program other than the English classes time for reading difficulties of some people. So we are working on that as well. So who are the students? Uh, obviously anyone interested uh, is welcome to our uh, uh, classes so we don't ask any visa or other uh, ID information. Uh, so this is probably one of the success of the programs. I don't know whether any other places they do have some of these requirements or not, so we don't. Uh, and also residents from other LGAs was uh, come up with the report that I have done again last year. So they were coming from all the way from Wright, Stratford, Marcy, Tombush, Carlingford, Bankstein and Routine. They are just some of the suburbs that I mentioned uh, in that report. So uh, again, we work with the community organizations and also with uh, public schools as well. Uh, so we provide uh, tutors for those uh, institutions as much as we can. I think at one point uh, Mission Australia was also asking us to send some of our tutors to them, uh, which was interesting. <clears throat> so how do the students benefit? I suppose uh, if I refer back to the previous uh, speakers that they were very much part of the success that they come to this sort of uh, classes. Uh, so they are all important and maybe equally important, not just in you know, the first point is much more important than others. But this is some of the things that we come up with that program that we can see there. Um, yes, uh, that's just uh, a really interesting part. Uh, 
Okay, just finalizing where to from here. So we are just uh, continuing our tutor training, finding a new way as well, uh, and assist other organizations at the world uh, with the presentation, with the other aspect of our program and why uh, reports. So just uh, probably one of the last point is uh, every program has its own issues and challenges. So we have some of the high challenges of like a uh, overcrowded classes that we sometimes find that a bit frustrated by students as well as by tutors as well as staff members have to deal with it. So there are just some of those things and as well as uh, finding a room availability in some of the extra classes. So we have that uh, issues as well. And um, the last point is, yes, my contact detail. And if there is any other questions, thank you very much. Any questions? I have left also some of the brochures if anyone wants to have a look at it. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Okay, we are running a little bit late. Um, in our programming, but we do still have two fabulous speakers, so please keep your tent, stand up and have a jiggle around at the moment if you want to. Um, as I introduce, um, well, I've got Donna Guayva and Kate Jones from the Literacy Tutor Online course. So Kamal might want to prick up his ears on this one, how to get his you know, tutors. Donna Guiva is Head Teacher of Education, Employment and Support and Kate Jones is Manager of Educational Systems at TAFE New South Wales in the Great Lakes campus. Donna and Kate are here to introduce a short online course that is designed to prepare people to become volunteer literacy tutors. Donna has worked as an adult literacy officer for TAFE and supported adult literacy students and tutors for many years across the north coast of New South Wales and Kate has also worked with adult literacy students and has pulled together all the information and resources into this online course. So please welcome um, Kate and Dawn. Hi, I'm just giving a brief introduction. Uh, we developed this because of our involvement with the local Great Lakes Better Reading, Better Communities Network. That's been running through the library and is now with our council amalgamation that's spreading up to Gloucester and to Tari as well. And we know that there are many people who um, want to become volunteer literacy tutors, but they can't actually make it to face-to-face -to -face training. So this is something that we can offer in a, a range of different ways. And we'll talk about the delivery methods at the end. It's not to replace face-to-face -face training, it's to support it and offer an alternative. And um, it's this is a living website, so it's not perfect, everything's, Going, can change. Um, if you've got, if you look at it and you've got some good ideas, email us and see if we can add things. So hopefully it's a dynamic website that will change as we go along. But we've got a started basis and um, we're quite excited because the Reading Writing Hotline is now linking and promoting it. And um, our first student phoned me and wanted to enrol. She was a woman in a wheelchair in a country, rural, quite isolated area with contacts with the local school. Then someone who's managing something like 700 volunteers, literacy volunteers in Western Australia is looking at our program thinking we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So it's just starting um, and hopefully it'll develop and yeah. So I just, so Kate's going to just run you through the program. Yeah. So really I'm just going to spend a few minutes just going through what it looks like so you can have just had a bit of an idea. So this is just um, the front page, if you like. It's You can just see that it has a number of sort of tabs across the top. And when we go into the information, this is the actual resource that um, we send students to. The resource um, has a whole lot of information. As you can see, we go through being a tutor, what that means and the responsibilities and things of a tutor, and then a whole lot of stuff about different types of learners. Um, from adult learners and we've just useful links at the end and I've just been writing down a whole lot of useful links to Google <laughs> and to, from today and we'll update that. 
Um, and even the sort of the things around supporting a workplace where a literacy volunteer tutor might go into a workplace to help with forms and all those sorts of things. So this is the kind of thing it looks like. You'll see that there's tabs up the top and there's two to three tabs up the top. And they, we go through an introduction, there's a little video and there's a learning stuff. There's a whole lot of other sections that go through it. I'm just gonna go through it really quickly. Um, and there's things like, this is in the being, the being a tutor part of this, the website where it talks about your role, but your responsibility as, as a tutor, confidentiality, setting up your spaces around work, health and safety, learner wellbeing, all that sort of stuff. Um, then you've got the little, it's like a concert team where you can expand the information so you get as much or as little as you like. Each section has readings, interactive activities, documents to download. This is what the adult learner one looks like, just as an example for you. At the top, they've got three tabs. So it's the introduction, this is the learning, and then there's an apply where there's a few case studies where you just get to choose what you do next. Um, to find that out. You can see that we get, um, we've gone through about adult learners versus child children. A lot of the stuff we say at, at the time, any strategy you find that works for you and your learner is perfectly okay. So you don't have to get the strategies for adult learners out of the adult learner section. <laughs> it can go wherever. Reading, writing, we do do a little bit about digital literacy because that is a barrier these days for a lot of people and it's even to support the volunteer literacy tutors, digital literacy, because as we've already said, so much of their um, information is now online as well. And there's case studies as well in each of the sections around a particular learner. So the stories that you've heard today, similar stories, but then also how would you help them? A few, what would your session one look like? What might session two, how would you follow it up? Those types of things as you can see, and some think about sort of stuff. So I'll just quickly flick on that. The other sections that we then have in, our, we've got a section on Aboriginal learners, and there's a little bit about Aboriginal learners and the barriers to literacy around Aboriginal learners. Reading skills, writing skills and case studies, and you'll see there's reading skills and often writing skills in each of the sections. So it's just about, because some people who are doing this may not read every section, they might be interested in working with Aboriginal learners. So they'll click on that section and go through that bit. There's ESOL, English as a Second Language. There's a lot about learning English. There's a lot about cultural awareness as well. Again, reading, writing, but for um, English, speak, it's for speaking and listening as well in that one. And there's some case studies. Young learners then, if you're working with children still at school, so there's other things to be considered that. You're often working with teachers if you're working with school students. So there's things about characteristics of learning with a child, again, reading, strategies, purpose of text. We've heard all that today, so I won't keep going through all that. And then there's a little bit about, as I said, about working with an organisation where you might go in and help people. We have our neighbourhood centre often has people come in because that's where people go to get their letters read that have come in from Centrelink or from legal matters, et cetera. So we've just mentioned the idea of protocols and communications within the organisation itself and how you work with the organisation, not just with your um, person you're tutoring. Again, um, ethics and confidentiality and those sorts of things, and then working with your clients. So there's a whole lot of, in each of those types of topics, there's a lot of information, as I said, there's actually interactive activities where they can click and get answers and get feedback. There's links, so that one up there at the moment is a link to um, a volunteer guide from Volunteering Australia. And there's things like um, work documents and strategy pages that you can download or even just blank sort of templates that you can fill in that you can use as um, to prepare sort of sessions if you're thinking about what you're going to be doing with a particular learner. Back in the site here though then we've actually developed a whole lot of just um, self, they're, they're multiple quizzes, choice, they're little choices, quizzes yeah. if you like so it's sort of that to reinforce for their own learning just to do it, they're just quizzes, they can go through them quite quickly 
um, just to reinforce for themselves. So don't forget we're talking about the people who want to be volunteer literacy tutors, not if these aren't quizzes for the people that you're tutoring, <laughs> they're for yourself, okay? And these are in order that when they get all of these successful, they will, it's the function's not there yet, but it should be in a week or two, that they can actually download that they've completed them successfully. They'll have a certificate they can take to a local organisation who would match them with a, a, someone who needs some assistance. That organisation may then put them through a criminal check at working with children and their own um, volunteer sort of program. So it's it's not, you know, we this is just the start and then we actually try and link them up with other organisations. So, yeah, but we need to know that they've retained a bit of information that they're not going out and going to say, well, right, here's the textbook, I'll tell you what to do. You know, I'll teach you how to read. <laughs> so we're avoiding that. <laughs> Okay, so that that's in essence the um, the web sort of the website and a bit about the information that is in it. What we do have is, I mean, it's just it's like a, a textbook. It's like a book in a library. You know, you can use it in a whole lot of different modes that you'd like to use it. So we do have now, as Donna just mentioned, people who individually are enrolling in the course and working their own way through it with some just email support or phone calls um, from a teacher. But they can also, and we've another model might be that they would still do that by, sort of by themselves as an individual walks in, but there may be that they might need a bit of help and it might be that there's local library that they go to to get that extra support. Then we've done, we can use it with whole groups. So if you've got a, with this whole groups of um, people who are wanting to be your volunteer literacy tutors, this can just be an online resource that a, a teacher, if you like, or a trainer is using to help them um, to with that. And But we can also do it with supporting it by Skype, supporting it by face-to-face -face workshops, um, you name it, there's a whole lot of different methods. And one of the me um, methods we're that. using, one of the things we're doing at the moment is our SL teacher, we have um, classes on a Monday and Tuesday. She's doing a class on a Wednesday training volunteer tutors to work specifically with her students. So she's using this website as an online resource. It's where everything's sitting. But she's also using it to encourage her tutors to pick up the literacy, the digital literacy, in the hope that they'll then pass that on to their students. So it's sort of sitting there as a resource, you know, um, centre, but it's okay, let's do it this way. And we're going to offer these train at these um volunteer literacy tutors when they've finished their course, um, a free course then in some basic computing to expand their skills in that area. So it's, yeah, it's a variety of ways, yeah. Um, I, we do have um, just some handouts that I'll just have at lunchtime if anybody wants to get sort of a few of those little um, ideas. And we do have a sheet if you'd like to get guest access to it. If we, I'll pass it around if you put your email address on it. We'll actually send you a guest access where you can have a quick look at it and see, give us some feedback, suggest things. Um, there are our contact details, obviously. Um, and if you want to enrol. <laughs> but as I said, we've got that information on um, a, a handout for you if you'd like as well. Um, I don't think we'll take more of your time than that. Just okay. letting you know it's there. Thank you. Did we have Thank time? You. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I just have a question. Yes. Um, anyone can enrol from around Australia, yes. around the world, anyway. around the world. <laughs> yes, online. Okay. Yeah. It, it, we're obviously fee based. Yes, it's yes. seventy five dollars. We kept it as low as I possibly could. And we <laughs> and we work for TAFE. So and we work yeah. for TAFE. <laughs> so all the issues that we've talked about. <laughs> yes, you're addressing. You're trying to address as you can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna yes. and Kate. <laughs> Okay, well, we've come to our last speaker today, um, uh, who is Lindy, Lindsay Chandler. She is a volunteer literacy tutor, so we've uh, worked our way to um, the, the core real thing. of the of the, uh, the story. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay is currently a volunteer tutor with the Literacy Network in um, Manage Wiringa. She's working with a range of clients from a 61-year-old Australian woman to middle-aged Tibetan men. Lindsay is a retired secondary school learning support and ESL teacher who has worked with young adults, autistic students, students with visual dyslexia, those needing re screen readers and very involved in disability provision for exams. 
She will talk about the challenges and the rewards of teaching adults who have already have their preferred ways of learning or avoiding learning uh, in their crowded work life schedules, their hard-won coping mechanisms as well. So.